What will he find out there, Doctor? His destiny. They did it. They actually remade Planet of the Apes. Starring Mark Wahlberg. You maniacs! You made it up! God damn you! God damn you all to hell! Movie Night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. Tonight, as promised, I'll be taking a look at the four remaining films in the Planet of the Apes franchise, which will include updated reviews of Rise and Dawn, which I first featured back when they were initially released. And I even changed my score on one, so stay tuned. First up, though, let's talk about the remake. They should have just left it alone. Released in the summer of 2001, this $100 million sci-fi action film was another ambitious mistake from director Tim Burton, which somehow managed more than a quarter billion in profit. When an Air Force astronaut crash lands on a mysterious planet, he inadvertently inspires a revolution between primitive humans and their talking ape masters. A baby-faced Marky Mark Wahlberg leads the group as best he can, but he's drastically out of his depth in this big-budget adventure, reciting corny one-liners like, Never send a monkey to do a man's job, and I'm going to go get my chimp. Tim Roth portrays a sinister chimpanzee military villain who spends most of his time shouting angrily or jumping around the set like some amped up parkour artist. It wouldn't be a Tim Burton film without an appearance from his longtime partner Helena Bottom Carter, so she's here playing an overly sexualized chimp to boot. She develops a somewhat romantic relationship with Wahlberg that's not only unsettling, but largely unearned. Michael Clark Duncan appears as a giant gorilla, and Paul Giamatti is a meek little orangutan, because of course they are. Elsewhere, Estella Warren and Chris Christopherson are wasted as totally superfluous human characters that have literally zero purpose. And last but not least is original ape star Charlton Heston, whose uncredited single-scene cameo is actually pretty cool, even though you'd hardly know it was him if not for a familiar line of dialogue. Despite its rushed production, the PG-13 rated film does boast some particularly excellent makeup, costumes, and more naturalistic ape movement. And from a technical standpoint, the 119-minute film is competently shot and well-edited. A few neat action sequences might impress younger audiences, but most of the material here has been broached before in better ways in better films. Take it easy, little fella. I'm not gonna hurt ya. I wouldn't hurt my own property. But for you, I'll make an exception. <laughs> hey, no harm done. Come here, kid. Come oh, yeah. You're not hurt, right? You're young. <laughs> oh, these kids, they bounce right back. <laughs> Play dead. Contrasting this Planet of the Apes against the influential sci-fi classic may seem a bit unfair, but by virtue of its very existence, it brought it upon itself. Conceptually, the basic framework of Pierre Bollet's novel is here. But Burton's interpretation is wildly different than the 1968 film, which is perhaps why he insists the film is actually a reimagination rather than a true remake. Gone is the subtlety, patience, or nuance. Every location is draped in shadows and cluttered with decoration of gothic inspiration. In other words, this planet is yet another Tim Burton funhouse, irrespective of its believability or diegetic connection to a world controlled by apes. And almost the entire story seems to take place at night. This update also adds a lot of unnecessary prologue, giving backstory to a narrative that doesn't require it, and introducing characters never to be seen again. The fact that humans can talk, and the apes are aware they can, completely undercuts the de-evolution implications of earlier movies. And relocating the titular world to a non-Earth planet hollows out the entire conceit that made the original series so powerful, replaced instead with a tired time travel plot ripped straight from an episode of Star Trek. 
Spoiler alert here. In an attempt to preserve the memorable twist ending of the original film, the screenwriters foolishly concocted a new conclusion, which sees Wahlberg traveling back to a present-day version of Earth in which all humans have been directly substituted for apes. It makes less sense than tits on a bull, and thanks to the picture's deservedly poor reviews will never be explained in a sequel. Whereas the Statue of Liberty reveal remains one of the best endings in the history of science fiction, this Lincoln Memorial moment is almost certainly the worst. Fans of Burton's trademark style might appreciate the film's visual aesthetic, but unless you're an apes completionist, this film is definitely one you should skip. Planet of the Apes is an insult to its namesake and a wholly pointless remake. But let's hear some of your insults from the YouTube comments. Calling it unnecessary, awful, and scattered, we all agree this is a very lame film. Next up, a reimagining that actually does things correctly, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. An auspicious revival. This $93 million science fiction film grossed nearly half a billion following its worldwide release in August of 2011. Director Rupert Wyatt borrows concepts and styles from earlier entries and other films to craft a compelling story. Although resembling the premise of the series' fourth installment, 1972's Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, this film isn't a proper remake, but rather a re-envisioning of the ideas set forth in the original five films. In fact, its narrative structure much more closely parallels Deep Blue Sea than anything else. The PG-13 rated plot follows scientist James Franco, who inadvertently creates a drug that boosts simian brain capacity when searching for a cure to Alzheimer's. Later, his pet ape, with his newly boosted brain power, helps start an evolution revolution when he frees his species from a harsh primate sanctuary. Unlike the original, there's very little here in the way of political commentary. The ape revolt is hardly analogous to issues with society. Even still, though, the story is fascinating and well told, with great performances by most of the cast. I say most, since Frida Pinto contributes very little as Franco's love interest. It's not really her fault, though. The script just doesn't give her much development. John Lithgow, though, is fantastic, portraying the Alzheimer-stricken father, who bounces from forgetful frustration to excited fatherhood when the effects of the drug began transforming him and his simian housemate. Franco himself does solid work as the gentle but ambitious scientist, but feels out of place in the overly serious story. Last but not least, Andy Serkis' CGI-assist portrayal of house ape turned super smart rebellion leader Caesar is a remarkable achievement, and the real hero of the narrative. Even without speaking dialogue for most of the picture, he undergoes a tremendously satisfying arc with real depth and humanity. What's this? What's he doing? I didn't believe that. What? He's asking your permission. It's a suffocating gesture. It's okay. Come on, Caesar. Off you go! The 110-minute film sprinkles in plenty of terrific references and throwbacks to the original apes. Some are subtle, while others are pretty overt, like the repetition of Heston's iconic line, Take your stinking paw off me, you damn dirty ape, which is met with a similarly earth-shattering response, Caesar's first spoken word. More or less a cautionary tale about the dangers of oppressing our animal friends, and perhaps a warning about scientific ambition, Rise feels a bit unbalanced. The pacing is a careful march towards an inevitable outcome, until the final act when everything is hurried along for a thrilling set piece on the Golden Gate Bridge. Whereas the 1968 film was groundbreaking for its use of prosthetic makeup, this big-budget reboot similarly impresses with astonishingly lifelike motion capture technology, which scored Rise its only Academy Award nomination. This movie won't likely be heralded as a classic anytime soon, but it's thoroughly entertaining from start to finish. A wonderful update to a decades-old franchise that should appeal to old fans as well as newcomers, it's also a surprisingly rewatchable film that sets up its superior sequel quite well. Rise of the Planet of the Apes is a fresh reboot with impressive effects. I thought it was great. Next tonight, my updated thoughts on Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. An excellent payoff. Directed by Matt Reeves, the eighth film on the surprisingly long-running Apes franchise was released in July of 2014 and is the second film in the reboot trilogy. Produced on a mammoth $235 million budget, this science fiction action film still pulled in an impressive $710 million in worldwide proceeds. Ten years after a deadly disease wiped out most of mankind, a growing community of genetically evolved apes and a band of human survivors attempt to coexist. In other words, Dawn builds off the events set up in Rise in wonderful and satisfying ways. Motion capture extraordinaire Andy Serkis returns in the lead role as Caesar, the highly intelligent leader of the apes. Having built a community of talking, family-oriented primates, Serkis is confronted with the responsibilities of diplomacy as he advises his tribe, signing, If we go to war, we could lose all we've built, before finishing his thought out loud by softly saying, Home. Family. Future. 
As an entirely CGI character, he is able to effortlessly bring an emotional and human performance to a decidedly non-human character. Most of this is accomplished with a furrow of his brow or a glance from his deep green eyes. The attention to his character design is impressive, like a scene where Caesar pushes through a subway station's turnstile while all the other apes hop over it. It's a blink and you'll miss a detail that illustrates his human upbringing and advanced intelligence. Commendably, this is one of the only big-budget films that uses American Sign Language, or at least an ape-inspired variant, as one of its primary on-screen languages. Dawn does not shy away from using subtitles. Karen Konoval continues to exhibit emotional depth as Caesar's orange orangutan friend, while the treacherous Koba is now played by Toby Kebbell in a menacing performance. Unfortunately, no human characters from Rise return, but James Franco is referenced in a particularly touching scene. Instead, Jason Clark, Gary Oldman, and Carrie Russell are introduced as hopeful but cautious humans who survived horrible conditions, only to be reluctantly thrust into a war with their violent primate counterparts. For reasons I can't quite articulate, Oldman just doesn't feel well-suited to this part, and Russell is underutilized to a criminal extent. Clark, however, impresses, imbuing his character with much-needed patience and bravery. We're introduced to the growing conflict between man and ape when a scout party unwittingly sparks a dramatic standoff with both sides on a hair trigger. Hey! 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 I'll kill you! Don't! Don't, Caesar, no! No! The tension that builds between these two groups is the entire driving force of the carefully paced film, which should leave most audiences breathless as it unravels. Throughout the 131 minute film, I found myself rooting for the impossible, the peaceful coexistence of two dominant species. We know it can't happen, but we still want it to. A scene where the uneasy alliance finally restores power, allowing a stereo to play music again for the first time in years, is an emotionally powerful moment. That is, of course, until you remember that cars have radios too, and they wouldn't have been affected by a defunct power grid. Dawn is the first Apes film shot in the taller 16x9 frame, and brilliantly captures both the lush forest areas of the American Northwest, as well as the haunting desolation of a ruined San Francisco. The imagery of an abandoned and moss-covered city center is very invocative of Naughty Dog's The Last of Us video game, in all the best ways. The visual effects perfectly blend the authentic locations and people with digital creatures that are just as lifelike. For their efforts, Peter Jackson's Weta Digital scored a well-earned Academy Award nomination. The PG-13 rated picture doesn't have many twists or surprises, but the final climactic battle between apes, humans, and other apes is a true spectacle to behold, as seeing an angry ape charge on horseback while firing a machine gun is truly terrifying. An extended POV shot that's fixed to a mounted tank as it plows through a hectic battlefield is also a real highlight. Michael Giacchino's score provides a deep and drum-like rhythm that further emphasizes the seriousness of the realistic narrative, but it also includes occasional musical callbacks to the original score's more whimsical style. Although we're left with a satisfying conclusion, some plot threads are appropriately left unresolved, setting up war for the Planet of the Apes rather nicely. Covering themes of trust, community, and betrayal, this is a touching story mixed with captivating and exciting action. An excellent summer blockbuster that improves with every viewing, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is the best apes yet and is worthy of my highest score. I'm re-rating this in amazing. Finally tonight, my review of War for the Planet of the Apes. A triumphant conclusion. The third picture in the Apes reboot series was released nationwide on July 14, 2017, earning back its $150 million budget within its first two weekends. The narrative, penned by returning director Matt Reeves and Mark Baumbach, picks up two years after Dawn left off, where ape leader Caesar sets off on a quest into human territory to settle a personal score. The first two films in this updated trilogy were only appetizers for what will long be heralded as a landmark achievement in motion capture technology. Andy Serkis gives the performance of his career as the hardened chimpanzee leader, forced to seek vengeance after suffering a staggering loss. He motivates his troops by reiterating his species motto, Apes Together Strong. The visual effects by New Zealand's Weta Digital that bring the primate to life are utterly sublime. The facial expressions, physical mannerisms, and deep green eyes all evoke a truly emotional and human performance. If any mocap character is going to break the proverbial glass ceiling and score an Academy Award nomination, this is it. Karen Konoval returns as well to portray Caesar's trusted orangutan advisor, Maurice, whose calm and measured perspective often helps rein in his leader's more brash decisions. Steve Zahn plays Bad Ape, a quirky hermit that Caesar's expedition picks up along the way. He has a few funny comic relief type moments, but they feel decidedly out of place in the otherwise serious film. 
But the implication of a talking ape not from Caesar's initial uprising is a big one, as it signals the possibility of an entire planet of the apes instead of just a small village outside San Francisco. The only real human character of note in war is Woody Harrelson as the villainous and uncompromising colonel, who doesn't hesitate to execute his own men when they show signs of disease. Echoing shades of Marlon Brando, he delivers a long and emotionally distant monologue about his son and the tough decisions he's made. Remarking on the pending war between apes, humans, and his own faction of the military, Harrelson punctuates his speech by stating, All of human history has come to this moment. It is a powerful scene and a real highlight of the 140-minute feature. Have you finally come to save your apes? I came for you. For me. You know I was here. I was told you were coming. The increasingly busy Michael Giacchino provides one of his best scores this decade, although Star Trek and Up, both from 2009, remain my favorite works from him. Blending driving strings, high pitched woodwinds, heavy drums, soft pianos, and a chanting choir, Giacchino has composed a truly haunting score that occasionally feels almost ethereal and patriotic. It is a beautiful counterpart to the impeccable effects and flawless cinematography. Even without characters populating the frame, the environments alone are still stunning to see, from the lush redwood forest to the snow-covered mountains in the north. Giacchino opens the film with a particularly neat drums-only rendition of the 20th Century Fox fanfare, which then cuts to on-screen text that helps bring the audience up to speed on the events that came before. Even though each of these entries do stand on their own rather well, consistent themes and characters allow them to mesh together rather effectively. Living up to its title, the opening 10 minutes of War for Planet of the Apes showcases a vicious and violent woodland battle between human special forces and resilient apes dug into their redwood hideout. Gunfire, explosions, spears, and battle cries rupture the speakers with a loud and enveloping sound mix. This first chapter is one of the most impressive action scenes of any war movie and instantly elevates this picture above its 1970s era counterpart, Battle for the Planet of the Apes. The PG-13 rated picture does have some tonal and pacing issues towards the middle though, as it drastically shifts from a war movie to a prisoner of war movie. I didn't particularly care for a few of the more convenient plot twists either. After 49 years though, these characters and stories are still impressive and consistently entertaining, even paying homage to earlier films with clever moments and dialogue references. A must watch just for the terrifically well realized motion capture effects, War for the Planet of the Apes is a thrilling example of why this trilogy is together strong. And here's what you had to say about it. Some called this the best yet, while others felt it was a downgrade. Your scores averaged to a 9 out of 10. I agree, I felt this film was awesome. Now some final thoughts on the entire franchise. When War finishes its box office run, the Planet of the Apes franchise should have grossed over $2 billion worldwide, an impressive accomplishment considering two of the nine films didn't even reach double-digit millions. There's something inherently invocative about the core concept of these stories, from the B-movie style of its title to the themes of equality and revolution that continue to resonate. Or maybe people just like seeing animals wear human clothing. Whatever its appeal, it's clearly stood the test of time. Despite some stumbles in the middle, this has proven to be one resilient franchise, with dozens of memorable moments and characters. Planet of the Apes showed us the template on creating a truly great reboot, as well as what not to do when attempting a remake. It's rare for a film series to reach nine entries, and it's almost unheard of for the ninth to be as good, if not better, than all the rest. While War wraps up Caesar's three-picture arc remarkably well, the series keeps moving towards that desolate desert universe established in the 1968 version, leaving the door open for future installments. I, for one, would love to see another sequel or two that jumps the story forward in time to when astronauts from the Icarus spacecraft, deliberately teased in Rise, don't forget, return to Earth to find the thriving ape civilization that Caesar helped establish. Seeing an updated adaptation of Pierre Bollet's novel using today's visual effects capabilities is an appealing way to come full circle on the half-century-old franchise. I'm thinking Return to the Planet of the Apes would be a perfect title for such a follow-up. Are you writing this down, 20th Century Fox? Until that tenth picture happens, which is reportedly already in the planning stages, we'll just have to speculate. That does it for now, but next week I'll be collecting some previously written and previously uploaded reviews to take another look at superhero films, if you'd like to leave a comment review on these movies. In the meantime, click or tap here to watch my reviews of the Star Wars franchise, click or tap there to watch my Dark Knight trilogy reviews, or click the jog wheel icon below to subscribe and see new uploads when they're released. 
Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thanks for watching, and have a good movie night.